Uh, in in uh, a speech that we've heard parts of from Brett Kavanaugh, uh, he talked about, uh, you know, what go happens at Georgetown Prep stays at Georgetown Prep, and that's the part that most of the most people heard. But in that same speech, he talks about being a Supreme Court justice or being a judge as an umpire, leaving your politics at the door so that you are able to be a fair, fair arbiter of uh, all things that, are, that come before you. In those comments that we just played, there are many people who say, Brett Kavanaugh wasn't behaving like somebody who'd be that umpire. That's the question here. Uh, the, the rules for recusal of Supreme Court justices are different than they are for the lower court judges for the simple reason that if you're a trial judge in somewhere in America and that you have a conflict, they can find another trial judge to take your place. Same with the courts of appeal. There are no spare Supreme Court justices. So anytime a justice recuses, that leaves the court at a diminished capacity. And it's usually up to the justices that will strike, usually. It's up to the justices themselves to decide whether to recuse. And they usually recuse for direct conflicts of interest. They have a family member. They were a judge that, uh, on a lower court when a case was decided. They worked on the issue when they were at the Justice Department. Or they have some personal financial stake. They own stock in the company, that kind of thing. Those are the usual reasons for recusal. Recusals on political grounds are really exceptional. Remember, Ruth Bader Ginsburg made some very harsh comments about President Trump, saying she might move out of the country if he got elected, that kind of thing. She later apologized for them. There were some suggestions that maybe she'd have to recuse from cases involving the Trump administration, but she didn't. She voted on the travel ban case. The government didn't ask her to recuse. So I think those questions would hang over Judge Kavanaugh, but whether he would actually recuse on political grounds if he's confirmed, I doubt it. And that would be up to him. It's not up to somebody else. Correct. All right. Nicholas, uh, there are there were several issues, and about a week ago, uh, there were people who would be concerned about how, the robustness of the investigation into Brett Kavanaugh, and that was what this last week was supposed to solve. But now there are a lot of people in the country who don't think it has solved anything. It hasn't become more robust. Uh, a week ago, or last Friday, we were talking about how Jeff Flake uh, may have paused um, the fact that there was going to be a cloud over the Senate Judiciary Committee and ultimately over the Supreme Court, uh, an institution that so many Americans are hoping to rely on in politically turbulent times. Now we go forward with this nomination. Does this have a, does this put a cloud over the Supreme Court? I think it does. I mean, the hope of the FBI investigation was that we might dispel the crowd, the cloud one way or the other. I think this is going to impair him. I think it's going to impair the legitimacy of the court. Look, I mean, at this point, it looks as if uh, a third of the men on the Supreme Court will have had credible allegations of sexual harassment or assault against them. That undermines the, the, the aura we have about the court. And so does his anger. I mean, the stagecraft of our judiciary, the mythology we have about it is that it's supposed to be above the fray. And we have had politicians, obviously, in the I mean, Earl Warren, former California governor, was a great uh, Supreme Court chief justice, but he wasn't angry like this. Well, Clarence Thomas was angry, but he wasn't partisan in the same way. And so now we have a judge who looks as if he may well be headed to the Supreme Court who brings a degree of anger. Uh, he's essentially a politico for much of his career and a partisanship. And I think that is unfortunate for for the judiciary in the U.S. Pete, let's just address that for a second, because uh, as you have mentioned, Clarence Thomas's politics are, are very, very conservative uh, by comparison to others on the Supreme Court. Uh, but for some reason, uh, despite the allegations against him, which were investigated before he was confirmed uh, to the Supreme Court against the, uh, the better judgment of many people, it has not felt politicized since then. How is this different? Well, I think it's different for a couple of reasons, simply because the, 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 we're in the year 2018. It's very different now than it was then in terms of taking these uh, accusations seriously. Uh, and uh, it's, the, it's, I guess, the fact that in, in Thomas's case, they basically came from one person, from Anita Hill. In Brett Kavanaugh's case, you have a number of people raising questions, uh, just a lot more willingness to engage on these issues. I think those are the, those are the things that make it so different. Uh, Nicholas, uh, w what can the Supreme Court, I mean, obviously the others on the Supreme Court and people who believe in this institution are worried about uh, uh, reputational damage. What do, you, what do Americans need to see 
to feel either secure or, frankly, what other options do they have? This guy is, is quite possibly going to be an associate justice of the Supreme Court by the end of the weekend. That's right. And, uh, you know, John Roberts is obviously conservative. I think he would uh, very much welcome Kavanaugh's uh, conservative ideology. Yep. But uh, the Chief Justice also cares deeply about the reputation of the court, the image of the court, and I think he will be troubled by having this as a blow to it. And, you know, I think one other thing we have to wonder about is there is some real possibility. Look, after the Clarence Thomas allegations, I'd say the subsequent reporting has largely sustained those allegations mm -hmm. and makes it seem quite likely that indeed those allegations by Anita Hill were correct. If in a similar way more people come forward against Brett Kavanaugh and tend to confirm those allegations, that will uh, further undermine mm -hmm. not just him but the entire court. And I think that's a real possibility. Hey, Pete, uh, I know you, you, you made the point that judges don't tend to recuse themselves on the Supreme Court for lots of reasons, particularly when it comes to political ideology. Does the fact that in his testimony, Brett Kavanaugh spoke of Democrats, spoke of the Clintons, uh, spoke of left-wing groups, there are going to be left-wing groups that bring cases to the Supreme Court. Do they have any standing to say, I don't think this guy can listen to my case? Well, if they can bring their case successfully before the standing is a question about whether they're allowed through the courthouse door to bring their case. If they bring their case, then they have to make a tactical decision about whether they want to seek recusal. They can. It sometimes does happen. You can say, uh, you know, you're just too biased to hear this, this case. I guess the, the contrary argument would be was that he was attacking the process of his confirmation, not... If for, for to use your term left wing, not a left wing policy uh -huh. argument or the kind of uh, uh, administrative question that might come before the Supreme Court. Uh, now, that may be too much of a legal nicety. And uh, the, the, the claims here of, you know, the, the canons of judicial ethics basically say that judges should not only have no conflict, but have no appearance of uh -huh. a conflict. Uh -huh. And that's where the more difficult question comes in. And Nick Kristof, he did say that himself. I mean, he's the one who said left wing, and he's right. the one in a speech to about Georgetown Prep. Uh, he's the one who said that a judge has to have the appearance, to be an umpire, has to have the appearance of leaving their politics at the door and not bringing it in. He did make that choice to bring this into the conversation. He both raised that expectation and then kind of uh, it, yeah. exploded it. Yeah. But I think that there are also you know, other larger questions. We obviously expect the court to have integrity, and at least I'm deeply troubled troubled by what you might call these small lies that I think it's almost unarguable that uh, Kavanaugh told about, you know, uh, Renate, the Renate mm -hmm. alumni. I mean, obviously, that wasn't just a matter of affection, and everybody knows that. And so I think that undermines the integrity of the court. And I guess I'd also say that at some level, if you look at the historic mistakes the Supreme Court has made over the last century, they haven't been because of lack of brilliance mm -hmm. or a lack of judicial reasoning. They've been because of a lack of empathy. It's been Dred Scott. It's been Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, it's been some of the cases about women's rights, uh, about gays. And watching Judge Kavanaugh there, I think one had to question whether in this kind of case coming forward, whether he would be able to have that kind of empathy that yeah. would contribute to a forward-looking ruling or one that is uh, ultimately an embarrassment for this country. Hey, MSNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there and click on any of the videos here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. You can get more MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.